Welcome to Gather for Wellness Radio. I'm your host, Becky Litwicky, and it's Wellness Wednesday, which means we get to connect with another kindred spirit to expand our health and happiness and move one step closer to discovering our own magic formula for optimal wellness. Today, Hema Ramsing is here to share tons of wisdom on how you can brew your own kombucha at home. If you don't know what kombucha is, she covers that too, along with the benefits that come from drinking this tasty tea. Hema is a certified nutritional practitioner and a 21-day sugar detox coach with an emphasis on consuming whole foods for health. She's passionate about teaching others that with the right foods, we can promote and maintain good health, and it can be done simply and easily without sacrificing taste. Here's a sneak peek. Um, but, you know, the health benefits, the digestive benefits, it helps reduce inflammation, helps boost your immune health, helps with your gut health. All of these things are well-known um, benefits of kombucha. Hey, Ma, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks, Becky. I'm excited to be here with you. Awesome. Awesome. So I found Hema in a group that we're in on Facebook, and she was just putting out some really cool workshops and programs about kombucha and um, some different things that I saw her doing. So I reached out, and here she is. And I love when I reached out to her, she said that she's just doing everything she can to um, share her knowledge with as, as big of an audience as possible and give them the tools and education they need to make the choices for themselves and their family. So I love the, the passion that you have and the, the way that you're showing up in the world. Thank you. It's, uh, it's exciting for me to teach people one tiny little thing that they can do to better their health mm-hmm. and And when they get the results, um, the excitement, you know, from them and then the desire to learn another little thing and another little thing until eventually they've changed so much for the better Mm -hmm. that they're just almost like a whole new person. So that's Mm -hmm. always exciting for me. I totally agree. And I think that's something that's, it's come up on the show before, like that, I think sometimes people think that a healthy or a holistic lifestyle or something has to be this like overnight transformation or it has to be like super duper hard, but really like the people that do it most successfully are just the way you said, like one change at a time that kind of like starts the momentum and just carries them to want to do other things. Absolutely. I like to say that um, making the changes and and the, the education that I provide it uh, doesn't mean that somebody has to completely disrupt or change their lives, but at the end of the day, it will change their life for the better. Because once you find that right um, diet and lifestyle for yourself that works for you, your life will change. Well, so now that we've kind of got a little little bit about you, can you just tell people a little bit more about the journey you've been on and kind of your story? Absolutely. It's been um, a long and sometimes really difficult journey. Um, And I'll try and kind of keep it a little bit short. But like many people in this world of health and wellness and a lot of the nutritionists that I know, I started um, down this path really because I had my own health issues. So I was kind of trucking along, being relatively active, but eating whatever it is that that I wanted because I was not the kind of person that... um, gained a lot of weight. And at that time, I didn't know how food affected me. Uh, but I was relatively active. And, you know, in my mid 20s, um, I got into a what seemed like a minor car accident. So being, you know, healthy, quote unquote, healthy person, um, I thought I was going to bounce back really quickly. I didn't break anything. I didn't sprain anything. I was 25 years old. Uh, but I didn't recuperate. And I actually never fully recovered from that. So I had a lot of pain um, and that grew as the days went by. So lots of pain, lots of aches. It got to the point where my life completely changed and I could hardly walk down the street without experiencing pain and fatigue. Um, So my life completely changed. And for about four or five years, uh, my doctors really couldn't tell me what was wrong with me. It was a lot of, you know, you're young, you're healthy, you'll just bounce back, just, you know, keep going to the gym and push through the pain. Uh, and it didn't work. And every time I tried to push through the pain, I would get these flare ups and I would be sort of 
for days, really um, unable to do much of anything. So it took about four years or so for me to get um, a diagnosis of uh, fibromyalgia, which at the time was sort of a catch-all term for a series of symptoms that um, went together, but there wasn't a lot known about the condition, about why people got it, what to do about it. So at the time, the doctor, the specialist that gave me this diagnosis also gave me the sad news that it was a lifelong condition that would never get better. Um, and really the only thing that I could do for myself was to take a handful of these medications and a couple of them to combat the side effects of some of the medications. And that was really what I, in my mind, considered a life sentence. Uh, and that didn't work for me. Um, I just really didn't at the time feel like that was a viable option. Uh, so I didn't do it. Um, and I fought through for many, many years and I would go through these intense bouts of pain and fatigue and digestive distress and I couldn't sleep. And there was all of this awful stuff going on. Um, and then sometimes I would be relatively okay, but I never kind of got back to the person that I was, the active person that I was prior to. Uh, and I also wasn't nearly as happy because I was dealing with all of this stuff. So um, I went through a long, tough struggle, uh, probably for the next seven or so years of specialist after specialist. And, and at the worst of the pain, um, I actually did start to take some of the medications because I, I was almost non-functional. Uh, but I kept, you know, I kept coming up against things like you have to take these medications. Um, Maybe you're depressed. Uh, people with your condition can't work. And so you're lucky that you're able to work. Uh, and I even got things from doctors like, well, you don't look so sick because I'm a relatively sort of upbeat person. So I kind of in some ways was just feeling like maybe this is all in my head because in some ways that's how they were making me feel. But I was, I was, I was really an advocate for my own health. And so I started to do some research into um, what I could do to help myself. And the drugs were not an option because when I did take them, all they did was make my mind fuzzy and foggy and the pain didn't go away and I didn't sleep better, but I was just numb. So that wasn't an option for me. And over the years, what I did was research different uh, modalities. So I tried physiotherapy, chiropractic, um, all sorts of alternative uh, um, modalities, traditional Chinese medicine, like you name it, I gave it a whirl. And then I stumbled upon the world of nutrition. Uh, and like many people out there, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I started sort of following the mainstream nutrition guidelines. This is how you eat healthy. Uh, and it wasn't really working for me, but I, I don't know, I guess intuitively I knew that this was, this was what I needed to stick with. So, so as I, uh, continued to research, I found a couple of things that really resonated with me, which was that possibly, um, people with, with fibromyalgia have nutrient deficiencies. Uh, and that's one theory among many. Um, and so I went with that and I ran with that and I, changed my diet. And then, uh, I was also working at the time in the corporate world. I was in marketing. Uh, and then I decided that I needed to make the full commitment to change my diet because this is really where my path was leading me. And I did, and it made a world of difference, a huge world of difference, which I wish I had found 15 years prior. Uh, <laughs> But all was, part of the journey, right? <laughs> it was it was unfortunately one of those things that the doctors had never discussed with me. We talked about all sorts of things like my physical condition, my emotional condition, my mental condition, but the food that I was putting into my body was never brought up. Even with all like the holistic I practitioners like chiropractors, acupuncturists, things like that? Uh, even with my naturopath, unfortunately. Wow. Um what I was eating was not forefront to treating my condition. 
Uh, a lot of supplementation went in there and, and I'm saying supplements were, you know, they did really great things for me, but diet had never come up. So, you know, in my own research and when I tried a gazillion different diets and some that were great and some that weren't, and, and then I, I did the elimination diet. So I eliminated all common allergens and started to add them back. And I was able to really see what affected my condition and what didn't. And armed with that knowledge, it really sort of helped me understand what works for my body. And then so, you know, I was working in the corporate world um, and I just quit my job, went back to school to study holistic nutrition because I had learned from myself the power that the food that I eat has on my overall well-being. And I wanted to learn as much as I could about it so that I could then teach other people the power of food. So, and I'm still on my journey um, and I still have great days and I still have bad days, but uh, those bad days are few and far between. Um, and I am able to really manage, manage things through uh, my lifestyle, uh, but, but predominantly the foods that I put into my body. So yeah, that's how I got from right. there to, to here. Hey, good for you. Way to stick with it. I, that's a, that's a long time to be in pain. So I, it is, you know, it wasn't always, I wasn't always the, um, the happiest in the, you know, I wasn't always my advocate. I have to say there were times where I almost gave up and just said, you know, I'm going to just take this medication and accept that this is my life. Mm -hmm. Um, because it is a struggle, yeah. but I'm glad I persevered and I went through it. Me too. So what did you find? You mentioned that uh, you, you had started to look into whether or not fibromyalgia was kind of associated with nutrition deficiencies or nutrient mm -hmm. deficiencies. What did, mm -hmm. you, did you, what did you find with that? So there still is a lot of um, uncertainty around what uh, causes fibromyalgia. So it is a handful of symptoms. Um, and people, everybody who, um, has it has a different, um, it, it affects them slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, whether there was nutrient, it's nutrient deficiencies. I've been reading a lot about possibly leaky gut mm -hmm. causing fibromyalgia. I've read some studies that say that it uh, is brought on in some people by some sort of trauma, sure. which could be an emotional trauma or it could be a physical trauma. And looking back on my life, I actually um, was experiencing both at the time. So the physical trauma for me was the car accident. Mm -hmm. But also I was going through a lot of emotional upheaval mm -hmm. that I was not dealing with. So in terms of the nutrient deficiencies, um, what I really decided to do was pay attention to the foods that I was putting into my body and whether or not it was delivering anything to me. Mm -hmm. So I will say that I did a course of um, IV therapy mm -hmm. because, because that was one of the theories is that if you're nutrient deficient, you're not always able to get everything that you need to bump up the nutrient levels in your body right. solely through food. So that was a choice that I made with my naturopath to actually try the um, IV chelation therapy. And that actually worked really well for me, whether it was placebo or whether it was real, I don't know. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> the idea is that was, that was my way of sort of trying to um, increase and, and rid myself of any deficiencies. And so now I just focus on eating foods that are actually delivering some good nutrients to my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of those is probably kombucha, right? Kombucha. Absolutely. I love fermented foods and beverages. So I remember not so long ago when I first started working for the chiropractor that kind of like led me down this path, there was a, a woman who worked there too, and she would bring in this little bottle of stuff and I was like what is she drinking and she told me she's like oh it's fermented tea and you have this this scooby thing and you put it in there and I was like so like turned off I was like what the heck are you this is craziness and then about a year ago I went over to her house and I got a scooby from her and I brewed my own so, <laughs> so sometimes it's not the easiest thing to um I guess bring into your lifestyle some people are a little bit weirded out by it 
Absolutely. And I, I absolutely was where you were when you first drank kombucha. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was the same way. I was like, what is, I had read about kombucha. I had read about the probiotic benefit um, and all of the great gut healing um, benefits of probiotics. So I thought it was something that I should try. Yeah. And, and I don't know how many years ago this was, maybe five or so years. Um, and I was totally squeamish. I had no <laughs> idea what to expect. I didn't know what it was going to taste like. And the first bottle that I ever bought, have you ever had this Becky where it has a tiny little like, um, gelatinous, Mm, yeah like there. like a little piece of the mother right it's that, like yeah. yeah depending on the br- I feel like some brands <laughs> filter that out pretty well but then there are others like the synergy ones that I love they they almost always have some floaties at the bottom <laughs> and the fr- I think the first bottle that I got was maybe um a synergy and it had that in it yeah oh I was so <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> it's like I I know this is supposed to be good for me but that's but yes, yes, I was the same way. So Synergy is amazing. I would drink them all the time, but they're also expensive. So we can make it at home. So I know you've been doing some workshops and stuff. Can you share with the listeners kind of an overview of what they would get at one of your workshops and then, you know, talk about like the brewing process and stuff like that? Sure. It actually, um, so kombucha does get a little bit pricey if you're buying it by the bottle. Uh, and that's why I decided that I was going to have to learn to make it myself because once I got over that squeamishness <laughs> yeah. uh, and I really, really loved kombucha um, I decided that, you know, it was going to play a role in my life and I was going to have it as much as I wanted. I needed to learn to make it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the great things about kombucha and that I talk to people in the workshops about is I don't always even just say um, you're adding kombucha into your life and that's it. For a lot of people by drinking kombucha it means that they're not drinking some of the sugary sodas or other things because they're replacing it so um, making it at home means that it is so much more accessible so in my workshops what I do is I take people through the process of brewing um, kombucha at home and everybody gets a SCOBY to take home with them so that they can start the brewing process and so it is such a it's so simple But it's something that's really scary for people because a SCOBY is a kind of an ugly thing (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and it looks scary. And I've had people come to my house and see my kombucha um, on my countertop and say, like, what kind of science experiments are (laughs) you doing here? It looks like a little alien or something, I feel like sometimes. (laughs) It really does. And then people touch it and they get freaked out. So this is why (laughs) I do these workshops to really give people that comfort level. And so brewing um, kombucha at home is super simple. All you need is a SCOBY, which is the culture that actually does the fermentation. Um, You need a little bit of a starter tea, which is the first ferment, and it's a bit of an acidic um, uh, liquid that helps with the start. Then you need tea and you need sugar. And the tea is going to be black or green tea, nothing herbal, no flavors. So it's really pretty basic ingredients and water, of course. Um, And once you have those, you are going to make kombucha uh, and you're going to grow your own scobies and then you're going to become such an advocate. You're going to share (laughs) scobies with other people so that they can do it. So, So the first thing I do is I actually create at home the first batch of super sweet tea. And I bring that to my class. So what people have to do at home, the reason I do it myself is because you have to brew this tea and let it cool down completely. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough time in a workshop to actually have that happen. So I bring that to the class first for people. What it is, is water, sugar, and this is probably the one and only time as a nutritionist, you will hear me say it's okay to use white sugar Mm -hmm. uh, because... You don't want any fancy sugars. You don't want anything with molasses. You want plain old straight up sugar. So it's black or white, black or green tea, sugar, and water. And you brew a super strong batch of tea. And it's going to be strong in the tea flavor Mm -hmm. and sweeter than you would actually drink it. Um, And then it has to cool down completely. 
once it's cooled down completely, you're ready to start the first ferment. And so to that, you need your SCOBY and you need a little bit of starter liquid. And the starter liquid or starter tea is really just tea from a previous fermented batch. Mm -hmm. And that uh, allows the acidic environment to make sure that there is no mold or bad bacteria that grows into you, in your kombucha. <clears throat> so once you have your super strong sweet tea, you're going to put it into a glass jar and you really want to use glass or porcelain. Um, you don't want to use plastic at all. Mm. Put your SCOBY in there. And, and this is where people get a little bit freaked out sometimes. They think, well, is there a right side up? Is <laughs> how do I put it in? Yeah. And I just say gently lower your scoby in there and let it do its thing. Yeah. If it wants to float to the top, it's fine. If it wants to hang out in the middle, it's fine. Just let it. So you put your scoby, your starter tea, into your sweet uh, tea. Cover it. And, you, and so your kombucha actually needs to be able to breathe. And I remind people all the time that this is actually a living thing. Mm -hmm. It is living, it's breathing, it's multiplying, it's fermenting. You need to allow it to breathe. So I just use a coffee filter on top of my jar yeah. um, and secure it with an elastic band. That just means that the coffee filter is going to stay on there. Air will be able to come in and out. Uh, and no bugs will get in because keep in mind that this is really sweet. And if there happen to be any bugs around, they're going to be attracted to this tea. Yep. So what happens in this process is you started your first ferment and your SCOBY feeds off of the sugar in the tea. So people also sometimes say to me, well, you're putting a lot of sugar in there and I don't want to consume a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because you actually won't. The sugar is what your SCOBY feeds off of and it ferments and actually turns that sugar into some vitamins um, and B vitamins are one of, uh, one of them that I know for sure are in kombucha. There's a lot of different um, thoughts about which vitamins are created and mm -hmm. the reason, the reason there's no sort of that I have come across, there's no consensus is every single batch that you make is slightly different, different yeah. especially if you're doing it at home. Um, but you know, the health benefits, the digestive benefits, it helps reduce inflammation, helps boost your immune health, helps with your gut health. All of these things are well-known um, benefits of kombucha. Mm -hmm. So, so you've got your kombucha, you set it into a, a cool place that, that um, has a lot of air circulation. You don't want your SCOBY to come into contact with direct sunlight. So just keep it somewhere slightly dark and then you let it brew and you just let it sit. So five to seven days. Some people test pH balance. I just go by flavor. And after brewing for many years, <laughs> I can just know what works for me and what doesn't. But what I suggest to people who are doing this for the very first time is after five days, just take a straw and um, move your SCOBY aside and get a little bit of the liquid and taste it and see how it tastes to you. Is it sweet? Is it acidic? Is it too sweet? Or is it, can it brew a little bit more and get a little bit more acidic? Because as you consume kombucha more and more, you're going to find that your taste changes. Mm -hmm. So first timer is going to want something slightly on the sweeter side. And when I say sweet, you know what I mean? It's not actually sweet. <laughs> Um, and then some people will want it to go a little bit longer. So once you taste it and you sort of feel like, okay, this, this flavor I can, I can um, handle, this is good for me. You're ready to kind of go on to your second ferment or your flavoring stage. So your kombucha actually is ready to consume right then and there after five, to seven days, maybe you want to do it a little bit longer, but let's say after five days you've tasted it, it's good. You are ready to drink it if that's what you want. You decant it. So you take your SCOBY out, you pour off the liquid, so this fermented tea, which is now your kombucha, and you can bottle it. You want to reserve maybe about a cup or so of the liquid to use as the starter liquid for your next batch. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, But the rest of it is yours to drink. If you want to flavor it, this is the time to do so. And I bottle it into those flip top 
bottles mm-hmm. uh, to allow for carbonation. But and you can flavor it with really whatever it is you want at this point. So you pour your scoby, uh, pour your kombucha into one of the slip top bottles, and you can add fruit juice, um, whole pieces of fruit, herbs, spices. Maybe if you want to add a flavored tea, this is the time to do it. Mm. Cover the bottle and you're going to let it sit at room temperature for a couple of days. And the reason I use those flip top style bottles is it really allows the carbonation to build up. And that's what makes your kombucha nice and fizzy. Awesome. I love the fizzy ones. (laughs) Absolutely. I love it. And, And I try because I have now so much kombucha and I have it constantly on the go. Mm -hmm. uh, I try some crazy flavors just because I'm like, if it doesn't work out, it's okay because I have three more bottles of kombucha. (laughs) (laughs) So I tried, I tried, um, adding some jalapenos. That was actually really good. Wow. I tried adding rosemary and other herbs. So there's so many things that you can do in so many ways that you can go. But what you want to do once you have this kombucha in your second ferment with your flavoring, in your flip top bottle sitting on your counter, keep in mind that it is still fermenting and fermenting slowly, Mm -hmm. even though the scoby is not in there. Mm -hmm. The sugar from the fruit or the sugar from the fruit juice is what is helping create that carbonation. And I tell people until, until you really sort of know the temperature um, of your home and how your kombucha reacts, Mm -hmm. burp it every day. And by burping it, what I mean is you just flip the top and you'll hear if it starts, if it's starting to um, carbonate, you'll hear that sort of that when you're opening like a soda bottle or any sort of carbonation. And the reason I say flip uh, to burp it every day until you get used to it is sometimes it ferments so quickly that you flip the top and you get a geyser. (laughs) My yoga teacher too has had him explode on her. Oh, and that and that has happened to people. It's, I've never had that happen, but I have had it ferment so quickly that when I like, I think I left it for three days without burping it. Yeah, the pressure inside the bottle made the kombucha foam up out and actually hit my ceiling. Oh my it gosh! Was, <laughs> and I had berries all over my ceiling. And it was, oh no! It was a disaster. So. Until you sort of get used to um, how long of a of a second ferment is good for you and your environment, I say just do a little a little test every day, and then sometimes you can leave it for two days. At that point, you really can leave it uh, for two to three days until you get the carbonation that you want, until the flavoring is where you want it to be. Throw it in the fridge, and you're ready to drink it. Mm. So it, I mean, making kombucha at home really couldn't be. Um, any easier yeah it's just you can make a cup of tea you can make kombucha mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um do you know i i know that some of the different bottles that you buy at the store have different uh, strains of probiotics is is just like with the the vitamins that are made is it all different depending on your scoby and it's, stuff like so- that that's, yeah, um, you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of, of discussion on the actual scientific health benefits of kombucha, and there's you know there is a little bit of controversy in terms of um, what exact probiotics are in there. Mm-hmm. So I can't say with 100% clarity that I can list off all of the probiotics. Mm-hmm. I also have to say that it's environmental. So yeah. have you ever made have you ever made um, a sourdough starter from scratch? No. Okay. So in baking, if you're making a sourdough starter, one of the things that they will always tell you is that part of what makes the starter unique is the fact that it's pulling bacteria from the air in your home. Mm. So a starter that's made at my home will be slightly different than a starter that's made at your home Mm. because it's environmental conditions and it's the same sort of process with kombucha or even water kefir is it's also pulling some bacteria from the air so it is slightly unique to the environment that it is brewed in interesting 
cool. How do people um, go about getting a SCOBY if their neighbor doesn't have one? So there are a lot of places that you can buy SCOBYs. You can actually, if you get a bottle of plain, unflavored kombucha from the store, Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually allow it to sit at room temperature uh, in the same way that you would with your, if you were brewing kombucha at home. So put it into a bottle, um, cover it with a breathable lid and let it sit. It'll actually start to grow its own scoby. Oh, cool. So you, so you can do that. It's going to take a little bit longer and it'll probably be a tiny little scoby and you start with small batches of kombucha. That's fine. Um, if, that's probably one of the simplest ways if you don't know anybody who has one. Yeah. But I'm betting if there is a holistic nutritionist somewhere in your area, mm-hmm. they're likely to have some SCOBYs or know somebody who has one and all you need to do is ask. Because anybody who makes kombucha knows that every single time you create a new batch of kombucha, you get a new baby SCOBY. Mm-hmm. So eventually you have so many SCOBYs. <laughs> you don't know what to do with them. Oh, you're begging people to take them. <laughs> You create what's called a SCOBY hotel and you just kind of put all your SCOBYs in there until the time comes that you want to share. Or I've heard people who have farms actually um, allow their chickens to eat extra SCOBYs or you compost them. Uh, Some people have dried them out. Um, I actually know there's a a local brewer here um, in Toronto and she has, she sells kombucha and that's all she does is she brews it and sells kombucha uh, and she obviously has a plethora of scobies mm-hmm. and she was learning to dry them out and actually make dog snacks with them oh. so you know there's many things that you can do but if you have a holistic nutritionist or a nutritional practitioner in your area ask them first i'm sure they'll be able to point you in the direction of a yeah. scoby yeah awesome. or you can come to a class like mine, um, a workshop that I, you know, I would do, and everybody not only learns how to make kombucha, but they go home with their scoby and some starter liquid so they can get started right away. Love it. Awesome. Okay. If time or money were not an option, what would you want more of? Ah, uh, gosh, that's a, that's a, I want more of a lot of things, but you know, I would love more opportunities to travel. Mm, that I think that's been one of the more consistent answers so far. With the, this is a fairly new question. I have like a, a few questions that I ask, you know, at the end just to see how people's answers differ. But um, that one seems to be coming up with travel a lot. So interesting. Yeah, I think I think there's a certain sort of set of people who um, who have travel on the brain, and once and once you fall in love with traveling and different cultures um, and meeting other people and ex- I mean, I love to travel and try different foods mm-hmm. from all over the world. Once you, once you experience that and you fall in love with it, you, you can never ditch it. It's, right. always, it's always on your mind is when can I get away and how long and where? <laughs> yes. What new adventure. That's right. Cool. If you only had five minutes to create better wellness for yourself, what would you do? If I only had five minutes, um, you know, I really strive to have a regular meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, So meditation is really a powerful tool. Um, As a holistic nutritionist, we not only, so the holistic part of it comes into not only do we deal with, you know, what people consume and their foods, but everything, their mental health, their spiritual health, their physical health. And meditation is so powerful and even five minutes, um, can make a world of difference. Mm. So that's one of the things that is on my um, things to do is create that as a regular habit. Uh, meditation is so powerful and so impactful. Uh, I actually last year gave myself the opportunity and the gift to do a 10 day of Vipassana retreat, which is a silent meditation retreat. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Being able to do one or two hours of meditation a day following that retreat was really the goal, and I haven't gotten there yet, but if I had five minutes, I would welcome five minutes of meditation a day. Cool. Yeah, that's the silent retreats I've not 
I don't know if I'm ready for one of those, but I'm sure they're <laughs> perfect for some people. And maybe eventually. I Now I'm like, oh, yeah, that seems, maybe I am, I don't know, interesting to think about. Yeah, it's, you know, I have to say that uh, I wanted to do it. I really should have heard some great things about it. I had the opportunity of uh, the luxury of taking 10 days completely away. Um, and I thought it was going to be challenging. And it was, but it was challenging for all of the reasons or for none of the reasons that I thought it would be. Okay. It was probably, uh, Becky, one of the most challenging things I've done in my life. Uh, but I actually say it was one of the most powerful things. And it really gave me an opportunity to know myself better. Mm, I bet. Cool. I, I will say halfway through it, I, I really thought I was going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> My, you know, your mind is a powerful thing. And my mind had me believing that this was just not the right thing for me to, to be doing is spending 10 days in silence. But it was just because of, there was, you know, some, some tough times coming up mm-hmm. that my, I, my mind was trying to get me to, to run away from, mm-hmm. but it was, it was fantastic. It was wonderful. I say anybody who's ready to do it should give it a whirl. Yeah. Um, but yes, that would be my five minutes. Cool. And then what is one of your favorite recipes for happiness? Oh gosh, you know, this is, this is a lesson that I'm learning myself. And actually it was, it was a lesson that I uh, learned quite profoundly during my silent retreat is um, really being true to yourself. Mm. Uh, And that's really tough with the, pressures that we have from around us, family, friends, expectations that others have, or expectations that we think others have of us. Yeah. You know, and I lived in that world for a long time in, you know, when I worked um, in the corporate world in marketing, there's a lot of external expectations and pressures. And I found that I was living and doing things more for other people and less for what was making me a better person. So I think the recipe for happiness really is understanding what is best for you um, and working within those parameters. Obviously, you know, not doing anything to hurt or harm anybody else, but taking care of yourself first Mm -hmm. because it's, you know, and I hear this, I hear this analogy all the time and it's probably the best one is when you're on the airplane and they're giving you the safety instructions, they tell you to put your own mask on first before helping anybody else. And that's the same thing. It's you can't fully give of yourself unless you have fully understood and created a space for yourself that allows you to be true to yourself. Beautiful, beautiful message, beautiful conversation. I am so happy to have had you here and to share all your wisdom we will have people out there brewing all sorts of kombucha before we know it. <laughs> I hope so. And, you know, anybody can always reach out to me. I'm happy to. I, I tell my students in my classes this all the time is if you're a little bit freaked out about what your SCOBY looks like, take a picture and email it to me and I will look at it for you and tell you probably for the most part, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but cool. it will- lovely conversation and I uh, I really enjoyed our chat same thing and we'll be sure to put all your contact information in the show notes so people can reach out and connect with you that's great thank you so much you're welcome we'll talk to you later okay okay bye bye thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of gather for wellness radio please head over to facebook.com slash groups slash gather for wellness to join our heart-centered group focused on feeling great so you can live life to the fullest. I would also really appreciate if you'd leave a review over on iTunes, Stitcher, or the blog. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends and family and on social media. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. But until then, keep being awesome! The information provided on this podcast and on gatherforwellness.com is not intended to replace a one-on-one relationship with a qualified healthcare professional and is not intended to be taken as medical advice. Becky encourages you to make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with a qualified healthcare professional. 
The entire contents of this website and podcast are based upon the opinions of Becky Litwicky and her guests, unless otherwise noted. The information provided is for entertainment purposes only.